You know, you hear so many musicians say that they write their best songs when they're depressed, when they're down, when they've had some kind of hardship. It's hard to write a good song when everything's going great in your life. Do you find that, that when something crappy is going on in your life, maybe that's the best time to get out the pen and paper and start writing? Oh, yeah. And I feel like when I have gone through hard times, that's usually the one thing that can kind of distract me and take my mind off of things. And when I have my guitar and um, I'm writing or singing, it's like I don't think of anything else. You know, you're in that moment. Um, so it's such a gift to have that because I, not everyone is lucky enough to find that one thing that yep. they are really passionate about and that gets them through a tough time. Or um, Yeah, the tough, the... Sad songs are definitely easier to write. <laughs> you know, the cool thing, though, is while that helps you get through it, there are going to be people, legions of people, that will hear your song and your song will help them get through stuff. From a, a songwriter standpoint, I mean, what would that mean to you to meet a fan one day and say, you know, Jordan, I was going through a tough time and then I heard such and such song and it made me feel better, put me into a better place. Oh, yeah. I think that's the number one goal as, you know, a songwriter. Just you want to connect with people um, above all else. And, yeah, for me to be able to reach one person and say, hey, I get get what you're saying. And, you know, I've been there, too. Um, that's the best compliment you can get. Chad Kroger from Nickelback. I'm not sure if you're familiar with, yeah. with, with Nickelback. Mm -hmm. um, there's some... There's some social stuff attached to those guys. They are sort of the w most widely hated band on the planet now. For some reason, but I everyone no wants everyone to loves buy them, their album. For sure. Know, it's ridiculous. I love all right? their stuff. I never yeah. forgot that either. I don't, I don't get it either. But he said the common thread tying together musicians is pain. And if you go and you look at it, let's, let's, let's pick a musician. Michael Jackson, conceivably the most brilliant pop mind to ever live. And when you hear about his childhood and the stuff that you know he had to go through, that obviously translated into some parts of Thriller or whatever. Don't you find it interesting that this medium that you are creating in is based in excessive amounts of emotional pain? And I know for me as a songwriter, I, I'm, I'm actually a, a, a hip-hop artist, and I wrote 70 songs for my album, and I whittled it down to seven. All seven that we basically agreed on at the end were all to do with pain. And it's and we didn't even think about it that way. It was just, this fits with this, fits with it. Oh my God, these are all painful. Isn't it a strange thing to be writing in a situation where you know people are probably going to end up crying to your music? Yeah, yeah, there is such a, um, you know, that pain is, or that tension even too, yeah. you know, like I, Fleetwood Mac is one of my favorite bands of all time. And, and that's the sound of a band breaking up, yeah. isn't it? It's oh, always yeah. the sound, that's the soundtrack of people just ripping each other's throats out. Totally. Yeah. And that there's something about that creative tension and yeah, the pain that just somehow writes those songs. And I think it's just your body, it's just got to cleanse all that and it's got to get it, get out somehow. And, you know, a lot of times you got really good songs out of it. Well, it's, you know? it's funny, though, because when people are younger or even when they get older, if they're having, you know, problems and you write a song, even if you're not a songwriter, you have problems, your parents are going to come, you know, is everything okay? Oh, yeah, everything's great, Dad, or everything's great, Mom. But then you write all this stuff in a song, and Mom and Dad hear it, um, they're probably sitting like, there going, Everything is not okay. That is, is, <laughs> have you ever had either one of your mom or dad hear something that you've written and, and looked at you and are you okay, Jordan? Is everything okay with you? <laughs> yeah, I know. Some of my songs, you know, they're, you have the heartbreak, you know, going through a breakup, that kind of sad song. Um, I actually did have a friend of mine uh, who passed away a couple years ago. So I do have a song kind of just me processing that mm -hmm. and grieving that. And yeah, but... I feel like we have a pretty good open dialogue. Um, I'm pretty close with my parents, and so um, maybe I tell them too much sometimes. <laughs> so there's probably not anything that comes out in the songs that they probably don't already know about. Um, but it is always nerve-wracking um, playing new songs, you yeah. know, for them, you know, saying, how will they, you know, take this or interpret it? Um, will they be yeah. honest with you? If, they, if you play a song... 
and they think, it's not your best work, Jordan. W- would your dad, would Gibby look at you and go, yeah, call, <laughs> call him for the right-hander here, you know? Like, or, like, or will they do what, what parents normally do, which is, go, that was lovely. Yeah, we're going to put that painting on, on the yeah. fridge and show everybody, even though it's horrific. Totally. That's one thing I really do appreciate about them is they – tell it like it is That's and good. and I appreciate that even though it might be hard to hear you know at the time um but that's good because this business you need thick skin oh, yeah. you're always going to hear people tell you why you don't deserve it so but, to be able to get the honesty from mom and dad but there's also mm-hmm. for me there's also I loved writing terrible songs mm-hmm. <laughs> and the reason is because yeah, you, you wrote know, a lot of them. Oh, terrible. Yeah, man. <laughs> like 70. But so but the reason is you know that if you've written something terrible and you've pushed it aside, you're getting that much closer to something great. Like you hear about okay, an album like Thriller. They wrote 200 songs for Thriller. 200. And they got it down to was it 16? That was a long album. The point is that the more that you write, the more that eventually you're going to be going, "Wait, I've got something here." So for me, I loved writing terrible yeah, 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 and you have to, and and that's what's exciting is, I'll go back to songs I wrote at the beginning, and you, you do you see that constant growth, and that's the best when you know, okay, I'm constantly getting better, and it's and you're never gonna, you can always learn something, you know, and uh, Dana, our lead guitar player, um, he's really good at really pushing me, and because sometimes, you know. I sometimes I'm a lazy songwriter and it's like, yeah, sometimes when it's not coming easy, it's like, oh, you know, it's it's easy to give up sometimes. But, um, you know, we do a really good job at pushing each other and say, hey, you do got to write those bad ones. And, you know, you can't look at every song of like, OK, this is going to be the next single or anything like it's OK to just have songs that, you know, maybe you don't put out there, but you wrote them and, you know, you're able to get better because of it. Speaking of songs, if there was one song that you wish that you wrote and you get to pick one. Hmm, that is so hard. Put Maybe. it on the spot. Right? <laughs> this is good. I love I Will Always Love You by Dolly Parton. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. that's, I mean. That, I'm glad I you so said many... the Dolly Parton version because, yeah. <laughs> Hey, man, Whitney's version is good, too, but it's not Dolly. It's not Dolly. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's just gets you in the feels every time. (laughs) So that's that's probably one of them. You mentioned, you know, you start off, you start writing songs. Now you're collaborating some with Dana, and I don't know if we're revealing this publicly, but you and Dana are not just band members, but you guys are in a relationship (laughs) together, right? So... Fleetwood How? Mac. Attention. Attention is good. <laughs> That's so Attention, good. Attention, good songs. Do you, ever, do you ever write songs like, I will kill you? Dana, uh, put a guitar line to this. Who's this about? <laughs> yeah, when we get a little more subtle might, than that. Oh, yeah. You might, you might know about, about it. So how, di- <laughs> how different is the process now where instead of writing a, a full song and bringing it to someone say, what do you think? you're actually sitting down and working on stuff together and and creating something as a team. Yeah, that's what's really cool about us as a team is I, you know, because we're a brand new band and starting from the ground up, you know, I'm, I I kind of take charge on the business side, um, booking, all that stuff, and the songwriting. He works at a couple um, studios in Austin, so he – can make demos for us and um, and all that good stuff. So we really complement each other well and, you know, even out the workload. So so it's good. And, you know, we recently, um, like I said, got to figure out how to co-write together. And so we're still, still working on that. Um, but we've had some success. Like, we've been able to complete a couple songs. So we hope to keep working. You said it's you know a brand new band, and for those who are unaware, the last time we had you on, you were performing with a band called Southtown. What became of Southtown, and how did the Barons become the new thing for you? Yeah, so we started the Barons uh, a couple months ago. Uh, we were living in San Antonio and moved to Austin, which is about an hour and a half away. Um, so it was hard to keep Southtown together just because of that move. And Austin is such a music city and there's so much more opportunity for music there. So 
we felt like we needed to make that move and um unfortunately you know we understand that people can't just get up and right. leave their jobs and um so so yeah so we found a couple new players and um are starting a new project the barons and are getting up and running with that but how do you leave the relationship out of the business or do you and how do you leave, <laughs> and 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 how do you leave the business out of the relationship yeah i think i try to be you know pretty professional about things and like hey when i'm here to work i'm here to work and you know not mess around and uh it's it can be really hard though you know if you're having a bad day or you know um or he's burnt dinner the night before or something and you're like <laughs> right, <laughs> right totally but like i said you know that it kind of that chemistry um is a good thing to have you know on stage or in the studio um so, but we try to, you know, turn on the work switch when we need to. Okay. We, we began talking about your dad, so we have to finish talking about dad. <laughs> well, we had him on the show you know, a few months back and he said that your mom would always see him on TV and say, John, why do you look so miserable? Why don't you smile a little bit more often? Um, what do you notice when you see your dad on television, other than the fact that once in a while there's a little, you know, barbecue sauce stain That's on his shirt or something like that. I have never seen a barbecue oh, yeah. sauce stain on the oh, shirt. Yeah, never. Gum in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think with him, he's just so focused on what's going on on the field, and that's where his focus is. And, um, yeah, he's not worried about how he looks or how he sounds. He's just, how can I get that team to win? And, um so, you know, he might not look like he's having the best time, but I think it's just, okay, I'm focused and got to do what I got to do. Does it still excite you to turn on the TV? And again, you don't see the manager on TV as often as you see the players, but, you know, there's dad. Hey, like, you know, that's my daddy on TV kind of thing. I think especially here, you know, because we were at out at dinner the other night and, you know, my dad was sitting next to us at the table and he was also on the TV and you don't really see that in Texas, you know, but you come up to Toronto and that's yeah. just yeah. the thing. And, um, so yeah, when you see it in situations like that, you're like, oh my gosh, like that's not to mention fans coming up to him and stuff yeah. like that. Right. Yeah. That doesn't happen in Texas either. So you'll be walking down the street and they'll yell, yell at him. And, Keep uh, it the best. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's pretty fun. I'll tell you what. What we need to do is, uh, we've got a t-shirt company on the side as well, and we've created a very cool t-shirt with your dad's image on it. And it has a little saying that was one of one of the qu quotes of two years ago when everyone was getting on Troy Tulowitzki. Troy had a great game, and I think I l asked him, I said, so what did you think of Troy's game? He goes, it was really good. You can suck on that. Oh, <laughs> so we have so this great image of your dad says... and the and the line. Suck on that. So I'm going to get you a, a, whatever size you are, and I'll make sure that you get one of those shirts, and I want you to wear it proudly, okay? Oh, you know it. I would definitely will. <laughs> with the likeness of her father. Why not? saying, suck on that. Oh, you're walking around wearing a shirt with my name on it. I am shilling the, for the company. Yes. I love it. Can I get one more in? Of course. What's the most surprising thing about your father that no one would know? He is such a softie. Like, he's got the biggest heart, and, you know, he... He does. He pokes around and has his fun. Wait a um, what does pokes around oh, mean? No. Hold on, no, no, no. Like, but does he have like a little workshop? Is he out there puttering? Is there like <laughs> tin cans full of bolts and nuts? Like, give me the, what's a Saturday morning in the middle of the winter in Texas looking like for Gibby? We like to sleep in, you know, so we'll, you know, 10 a.m. getting up, waking up is what, you know, he likes to do and... He'll make some eggs. He loves a good omelet. He's a really good at making What's omelets. he like in his omelets? He, all kinds of stuff. He yeah. loves meat. Um, <laughs> Go figure, right? <laughs> he loves He's not bacon. a vegetarian, right? Oh, no way, Jose. Um, but yeah, he'll, you know, so make some breakfast. Uh, he loves to organize and clean. Like, he'll be out there in the garage just organizing wow. his stuff. When dad comes home, everything gets really... Whoa! <laughs> I can't even believe so that. I have to like do something. I feel like he needs after a while. He'll enjoy himself for like a couple weeks, and then he's like, "Okay, I need to clean, clean, or do something with my time." <laughs> so you're thinking 
stepping away from this game is probably not something he's ready to do anytime soon. I don't think so, yeah. I think he's still got a good maybe 10 years in him. I and would say. your mom go bonkers if he was home all the time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. <laughs> would she just Five be like, you got to get enough. a job, Five man? Five months is enough. Yeah, they got to. Well, you know what he could do? He could go on tour with you, you and go. work as one of your roadies. Oh, man. Oh, Wouldn't that be fun? That? Oh, he is so funny. He always has his video camera. And he'll be carrying the speakers with us. We load everything up in his truck. Poor, I feel so bad because we've put so many dings. dings on it, you know, but he loves it. He, yeah, gladly would be our roadie for sure. You know, <laughs> when I first mentioned to your dad about whether or not you'd be interested in coming up here and doing something at Metalworks, his eyes lit up and I'm honestly, and I'm get, getting all choked up, but I'm I, one of the most proud fathers you could ever see. And anytime... Your name comes up. I mean, he just turns into, like you said, in many ways, he does turn into a soft because he is so proud of, of his family. Yeah, he, he really is. He's so supportive and he just always has been. You guys and... are going to make me cry, man. <laughs> <laughs> I know, me too. Yeah. No, he's he's the best. Yeah, he has the biggest heart out of anyone I know and uh, would do anything for his kids or, you know, his friends or anybody. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to throw it out there right now before we go. At some point, with the Barons, you and Dana need to write a song about John Gibbons. Yes, I agree. I like yeah. that. that. I take on the challenge. Can, can, so can we call it <laughs> Nut Cutting Time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the title. <laughs>